I'm now going to answer a 2P paper, and this is the June 2018 paper. Starting with question one, which of these quantities is a vector? Now, this is just a list you're going to have to learn off by heart. So personally, I would learn all six vector quantities and then assume everything else is scalar. So our vector quantities are displacement, acceleration, velocity, momentum, force, and weight. So do any of these feature in our list? Yes, they do. A, acceleration. Which of these is the correct unit for momentum? So momentum, we can work this out by looking at the equation. So momentum equals mass times velocity. We know the unit of mass is kilograms. Velocity is meters per second. Just pop them close together and therefore it's kg meters per second, which is A. The photograph shows a toy train at rest on a horizontal surface. Why is the toy train at rest? So it must be at rest because there can be no resultant force. And I, as I look down the answer, I can see that, yeah, C is the correct answer here. The mass of the toy train is 150 grams. State the equation linking weight, mass, and gravitational field strength, G. That is weight equals mass times gravitational field strength. And you can write that out in full if you prefer. Calculate the weight of the toy train. So weight equals mass times G. We know that the mass is 150 grams. We need to divide it by 1,000 to get it into kilograms. Multiply it by G, which on Earth is 10. And when you've done that, you get an answer, which is 1.5 newtons. This question is about waves. Diagram 1 shows a small boat on the surface of the sea. The boat moves up and down as water waves pass underneath it. Use diagram 1 to calculate the wavelength of the water waves. 1 centimetre on the diagram is 200 centimetres. So first of all, let's mark on here what a wavelength is. So it's from one peak to another peak. It's up to you if you do it from trough to trough. Then you want to join together those two points and measure it with your ruler. And once you've measured accurately, it will be around 7 centimetres. So then just use this scale. So 1 centimetre is 200 centimetres. So do 7 times 200 to get 1,400. That's more of a common sense question. State the equation linking wave speed, frequency and wavelength. So over here I'm going to show my formula triangle. And then remember you need to write it out of that. So here is your final answer. The frequency of the wave is 0 0.4 hertz. Calculate the speed of the water wave. So writing out the equation again. We know that the frequency is 0 0.4 hertz. The wavelength we've just calculated is 1400. Now quickly check your units. We were given our wavelength in centimetres, but we need our final answer in metres per second. So we need to convert 1400 centimetres to metres by dividing by 100. And once you've done this, you get a value which is 5.6 metres per second. Water waves are transverse waves. State another example of a transverse wave. Well, any electromagnetic wave here, so light is the one I'm going to state, but you could have stated any of them. Diagram 2 shows waves passing through an opening in a harbour wall with a boat in a calm area of water where there are no waves. State the wave phenomenon that causes the waves to spread out as they pass through the opening in the harbour wall. Now that is diffraction. Discuss what would happen to the boat if the size of the opening in the harbour wall changed. So remember that maximum diffraction occurs when the gap is the same size as the wavelength. So if you increase the size of the gap, then you get less diffraction. And if you decrease it, then you get more diffraction. So first we'll make the statement, greater diffraction occurs when the gap is narrower. Less diffraction occurs when the gap is wider. And then make a general statement that greater diffraction causes more waves to act upon the boat. You could have written the opposite here. Question three. A student uses this apparatus to investigate how the angle of a ramp affects the time taken for a toy car to move down the ramp. So angle of ramp is therefore independent variable, which is what we're changing. I always like to label things, you know this by now. 
and we're measuring the time, so that means it's the dependent variable. This is the student's method. Set the angle of the ramp to 10 degrees and measure the time for the car to travel from A to B. Repeat the experiment for five different angles using the same car traveling from A to B. The table lists some variables in this investigation. Place one tick in each row to show how the to show the independent, dependent, and control variables. Oh yeah, I've accidentally already done this. So, type of toy car. Well, we need that to stay the same, so that's a control variable. Time taken to travel from A to B. Well, I've already labeled this as being the dependent variable because it's what we're measuring. The angle of the ramp. Well, that's what we were changing, so that's the independent variable. And the distance traveled down the ramp. Well, that's the control variable. These are the students' results. Draw a table of the students' results. So, first of all, we're going to state the angle on the left-hand side of the column. And remember, we need that in degrees. And then on the right-hand column, you have what you're measuring, so the dependent variable, so that's the time in seconds. Don't forget your units. So starting with the lowest angle, which was 10 degrees, going up in order 20, 30, 40, 50. I'll just make sure I've marked off what I've done. So at 10 degrees, the time was 1.16 seconds. 20 degrees, it was 0 0.86. At 30 degrees, it was 0 0.50. 40 degrees, it was 0 0.59. At 50 degrees, it was 0 0.54. The graph shows the results of the student's investigation. Circle the anomalous point on the graph. So which one doesn't fit the trend? Well, it's this one. Suggest so how the student should deal with the anomalous result. Well, they should ignore it and then probably repeat it. Draw the curve of best fit on the graph. So you're gonna to have to do this using a smooth curve because they haven't told you to join it point by point. So I'll try my best to do that neatly now. I think that's as good as I'm gonna get on the iPad. Suggest why the student did not start either axis from zero. Well, firstly, that's because the time would never be zero. And also, if you actually look at the graph paper, it means that you occupy as much of that graph paper as possible. A student uses an electromagnet to pick up small pieces of metal made from iron and steel. Describe the construction of an electromagnet. You may draw a diagram to help your answer. So first of all, I'm going to draw my iron core. And then I'm going to show the coils of wire which wrap around that iron core. And then remember, we need to attach it to a power source, so just a battery here. And now let's label it. So soft iron core, coil of wire, and here's your battery. When the student turns off the electromagnet, he observes that the pieces of steel remain on the electromagnet, but the pieces of iron fall off. Explain this observation. Well, that's because steel is a hard magnetic material, so it retains its magnetism. Iron is a soft magnetic material, so it loses its magnetism. So here we go. Steel is a hard magnetic material and therefore retains its magnetism. And you need to point out that there is attraction between the steel and the electromagnet. Iron is a soft magnetic material and loses its magnetism easily. The table and graph show the melting points of different metals. So lithium has the highest melting point here, cesium has the lowest. It looks like we're doing a chemistry experiment. What is the name of the type of graph shown? Okay, this is a bar chart. Give a reason why this is the correct way to display the data. And the easiest thing to say here is because the data is discontinuous. Which means it fits into particular categories. When these metals melt, they turn from a solid into a liquid. 
Compare the arrangement and motion of particles in a solid and a liquid. This is a nice question. So let's make sure we answer both parts. So let's start with our solid. So remember, you need a very regular arrangement. They need to be touching. Whereas in a liquid, there's more space between them. But not so much space that there would be with a gas. So let's talk about their arrangement. So in a solid, there is a regular arrangement of particles. And then we want to say the particles vibrate in fixed positions. Now we'll take the liquids. In liquids, there is an irregular arrangement of particles. The particles move more freely. Describe the changes that occur when a liquid boils to form a gas. Refer to particles in your answer. So when a liquid boils, it gains kinetic energy. So we'll state that first of all. Particles gain kinetic energy. And what happens when they form a gas is the particles with the most kinetic energy escape the liquid. Two scientists, Geiger and Marsden, used alpha particles to investigate the structure of an atom. The scientists directed a beam of alpha particles at a thin strip of gold foil. They observed that most of the alpha particles passed straight through the gold foil. State the conclusion that was made about the structure of the atom from this observation, and that is that an atom must be largely empty space. Because if they're passing straight through, it's because they're not coming anywhere near the nucleus, which is positively charged. And as alpha particles are also positively charged, they would repel. A small number of alpha particles were deflected by more than 90 degrees as they passed through the gold foil. Explain why this shows that the centre of the atom has a positive charge. I've already touched on this accidentally. So alpha particles are positively charged and are therefore repelled. And don't worry about how much space they give you to answer these questions. If you've made three good points, it doesn't matter how much space you occupy. Seven, a company has 50 holiday homes located on the coast of an island. The company wants to develop a renewable method of generating electricity for the homes. They consider these three options, solar cells, wind turbines, geothermal. Discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each option. So let's start with solar cells. Solar cells do not cause atmospheric pollution because they don't release carbon dioxide and they are renewable. The great thing about solar cells is they can be used in remote locations, so on top of little houses in the middle of mountains. However, major disadvantage is that solar cells, however, are unreliable because obviously they only work when the sun shines and you need a large number of panels. Now let's talk about wind turbines. We're not going to talk about the not causing atmospheric pollution being renewable because there's only one marking point for stating that once. So an advantage of wind turbines is they can be located off shore and that's good because the disadvantage is that they cause visual pollution. if placed closer to towns. Lastly, let's look at geothermal. Geothermal has the major advantage of being a, re a reliable source of energy. But the major disadvantage is there's very few places you can actually harness it. So, but it can only... So effectively where you have two tectonic plates meeting. such as Iceland. A man stands on a wooden board to paint a wall as shown in diagram one. The diagram shows some of the forces acting. State the principle of moments. Well, that is that anti-clockwise moments equal clockwise moments. Calculate the force X, ignore the weight of the wooden board. 
So we need to work out the ratio of these two lengths effectively. So we know the whole length is two meters, but that he is only 1.4 meters away from one end. So I did 1.4 divided by two to get this as being 0 0.7, and this will therefore be 0 0.3. Now, because he's much closer to the end with force x, it means that much more of his 600 newton weight will be going through force x. So effectively, what you do then is you do 0 0.7 times his weight, which is 620 newtons, which is 434 newtons. And don't forget to state the equation you're inadvertently using, which is that moment equals force times distance. So effectively, you kind of need to look at it and decide. So 620 newtons of his weight is acting downwards. There's clearly going to be much more of that upward force acting at the side that he's closest to, so make sure your answer here is sensible. The man walks to the other end of the wooden board as shown in diagram 2. Explain the change in force x as the man walks along the wooden board. Well, we know because he's moving to the opposite end that force x must decrease in size. So therefore, in terms of moment, the clockwise moment of the man must decrease, whilst the anti-clockwise moment increases. Right, I hope you found that paper helpful, guys. Don't forget to like and sub if you haven't already.